Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How is everybody? Well, I'm Joel, I'm a teaching guy here, and we are starting our new series today called Summer of Joy, where we are talking about the book of Philippians. It was a letter that Paul wrote to the Church of Philippi. And the crazy thing about this book, it's just the theme is joy. He wrote the book from prison. You can be confident. If you ever get a letter from me from prison, there will not be a lot of joy in it. There'll be a lot of excuses and I'm not guilty. Get me out of here, I promise, right? But we're gonna look at uh, how to keep joy in all situations. Real quick, for me, this week's kind of exciting week. Uh, this showed up at my front door It's my new book, Keep It Light. Yeah, yeah, we did a series on this. uh, I guess it was last year about this time. We did a series on this. Some of y'all remember that and uh, worked it into a book. It will be out in two weeks. uh, And I told the first service, if you really love me, you will not buy this book back there. It's there, you can get it. But if you really love me, you'll go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Christian Book and buy it there so that I can get a record of the sales online, okay? I had a guy come up to you afterwards. He's like, hey, I want an autograph. I don't really love you that much. (laughs) It was your brother, Natalie. Rick said that. He came up and said, I really don't love you that much. I want to read the book. I was like, okay. So I signed the book. Anyways, it's back there if you want it. But if you love me, you will keep my commands. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you, uh, you can get it wherever you want. It's online. If you get it online, um, it helps me on terms of, you know, showing the publisher that they didn't make a mistake publishing my book. But uh, if, again, whatever, however you want to do it, you do your thing. Okay. It's America. Yeah. Hey, so we're going through the book of Philippians. And I'll tell you, I, this Philippians is one of my favorite books. It's called the book of joy. And Paul, like I said, he wrote this book from prison, which is really kind of mind blowing because throughout it, he just talks about over and over again, how like you can have joy in the middle of what, no matter what's going on. So I want to give you a little background. I'm going to go full teacher mode today on y'all. If y'all are cool. Um, I'm going to give you a little background and like, it'll be like a a class, but I need you to stick with me because there's going to be some really life-giving stuff at the end. So uh, when, you know, this book came out this week and what's always interesting is, is I'm always curious what the bio they're going to put on the back. You know, the bio about Joelle Malm is blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And I'm always self-conscious about bios because first of all, I, I don't feel like they actually encapsulate the wholeness of what I am. I mean... Look at me, right? Can words describe this? No, I'm just kidding. But I get nervous on bios because like there's so much stuff. I had one time, for a while I had on my website like this long bio of all the stuff I had done in my life, which I've done a bunch of weird stuff. We started a cafe in Peru. I've been a pastor. I've been an entrepreneur. I've started businesses. I've led outdoor expeditions around the world. And I spoke at this one event one time and the lady read the whole boring bio and I was like, okay, never again. So I pulled that all off the website and I spoke at an event recently and the lady was like, I, I asked her, I was like, can I just introduce myself? And she's like, well, no, I, I, I'm introducing the speakers. And I'm like, yeah, but let me just introduce myself. I'll explain who I am once I get up there. And she's like, she was offended that I wouldn't let her introduce who I was, but I, I was worried about what she was gonna say, right? And how many of us, like, you're probably this way too. Like there's certain things you wanna be known by and there's other stuff you don't really want people to know you by. Like some of you are like, you dread when they have to do those background checks. You're like, I don't want to be remembered for that anymore, right? Right? Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> but we do want to be known for certain stuff. And we're weird about what we not be known for. I had this friend and, and uh, he, he, when you talk to him, like in the first five minutes of meeting, he'd be like, yeah, man, I'm from LA. And we're like, oh, okay. He's wearing an LA, base, you know, LA Lakers baseball cap. And he's got like LA everything. And hey, did I mention I'm from LA? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know you're from LA, right? One day I asked him, I was like, how long have you been in Texas? And he's like, 18 years. I'm like, bro, you're not from LA anymore. You're from Texas. No, bro, but I'm from LA. I'm like, you ever notice how people take pride in their geography, like where they're from geographically? Like, I know some of y'all, when you go over to New Braunfels, you're like, no, I'm not one of you people. I'm from Seguin, <laughs> right? I know how y'all are, Seguin, Seguin. <laughs> you don't want people to think you're from New Braunfels, those people? They're no, from- you're from, oh, sorry for from for, for New Braunfels. <laughs> anyway, we are like, we get our identity from such weird things. Like, I, you guys know how weird I am about being called pastor. I don't like being called pastor. 
I don't know why. Um, the weird thing is there's some doors that opens for me and people are like, you know, oh, pastor. Like that, and they're like, oh, pastor. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, I'm, don't call me pastor. I had a lady last week. She came up to me and she's like, hey, I'm really sorry, but can I please call you pastor? And I was like, oh, please don't. She's like, I just feel like it's a respect thing. And I feel weird not calling the man of God pastor. And I'm like, don't call me the man of God. I don't even like that. Like, <laughs> You got stuff in your life that you're just like, I don't like it when people call me that, right? Maybe you've got some roles and you're like, just call me by my name. And, like, and they call you, you know, I was talking to one of the guys here, he's a councilman and he's like, man, I get it. He's like, I hate it when they call me councilman. He's like, just call me by my name. But they're like, all these people are like, oh, but you're councilman, right? We got stuff we want to be known for and stuff we don't want to be known for. And it can be really tricky. And we live in this world right now where identity is this huge thing. Have you noticed that? Like everybody's all about identity and we're convinced you can just be anything you want, anytime you want, like anytime. Like if you wake up and you feel like an alpaca, <laughs> the school has to say, oh, he's jo little Joey feels like an alpaca this morning. So let him do his thing. <laughs> like, oh, we just, we all acknowledge that. And I, I want to be, you know, I want to be going, I want to go by my pronouns, Al, Paca. <laughs> whatever it is, right? And we get super hung up on this identity, but, but the Apostle Paul, man, he does a lot, a lot of addressing about this, this issue of identity because a lot of times the way you see yourself is really, it's an important thing in how you identify with your relationship with God. And so Paul unpacks this identity thing a lot. And what we're gonna talk about today, if you can get this down, it really could change everything about you because I think it's at the foundation of what God wants to work in your life. We're going to be talking about today finding your identity with a word, what, what Paul says is in Christ. In fact, uh, over 160 times in Paul's letters, he talks about the importance of things being in Christ. Yep, that's true. So a little bit of background. Paul, Paul, first of all, he never met Jesus. The guy who wrote half the New Testament never met Jesus, like in person. Paul was after Jesus had already died. This little sect of Jews grew up and became these little, the name Christians was actually derogatory at first. It was like little Christs. It's like some name Trump would have called somebody like, hey, what's up little Christ, right? But I hadn't thought of that until just now. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, like it was a derogatory term. And Paul was like, I'm not gonna let you people pollute my faithful Jewish religion. So he was around persecuting these little Christs. But he has this moment where he's on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians and he gets like flattened by this light and his voice comes out of heaven and says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Now what's fascinating about this, and this is why Paul's so obsessed with this term in Christ. It's interesting because Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the followers of Jesus. But Jesus said, you're persecuting me which comes down to this idea that we're called the body of Christ. There's this very real thing that happens when we accept Christ. We're actually invited into being part of him. And when, he, when we suffer, he suffers with us in Christ. And this becomes a very real thing to Paul. So Paul, he's blinded. They have to lead him into Damascus. He meets this guy that God tells him to meet there who's terrified to meet Paul because he's like, that's the dude that kills people like me. Speaks to Paul. Paul is converted instantly. But what happens is Paul actually disappears for several years. We don't know what happened. But there's a very good possibility that during this time that he spent in the, back, in the Arabian desert, it says, that God actually personally through Jesus discipled Paul. Because Paul had some revelations that you, when, when you read him, this is what's encouraging to me. Even Peter, the apostle Peter, who actually hung with Jesus, like he hung out with Jesus. He knew Jesus personally. They were tight. When Paul came along and Paul started preaching things, he was like, at one point, Peter says, I don't understand everything Paul's saying, but I know he's right. So make sure you listen to him. Paul had some massive, insane revelation that was probably given to him by God himself. In fact, he hints at it. He's trying to be humble, but he's like, I know this dude that was lifted up into heaven and shown wonders I can't even tell you about. Like he was the dude probably, right? But there's a very good chance he was a disciple because he had this deep revelation. And that's why sometimes it's frustrating when you're reading Paul, you're like, Paul, like what in God's name, literally, it was inspired. Are you trying to say here? And Paul, he always brings it back though to, you've got to find your identity in Christ. Right. So Paul takes off and he goes on this missionary journey. Okay. So this is kind of the map of the area. This is the Mediterranean. All goes over here. You got Italy right over here. And then it comes down over here, the Albania and Greece is right here. This is Asia. And this is Philippi. Okay. Philippi is actually technically in the area of Europe. 
Paul was intending, I'm going full teacher mode today, right? Like I got my map. Like, like it's, yeah. Paul was intending to go to Asia, but it says the spirit kept keeping him, pushing him back from that, which that's a message in itself. Sometimes the, the winds that you're facing, you think are opposition are actually God pushing you to right where you need to be. But he ends up in, uh, he wants to go over here to Asia. Now tip here, a little geography lesson. Historically, the division between what's Europe and what's Asia is this area right here called the Bosporus. This is where Constantinople is, modern day Istanbul. Everything here from here on is Europe. Over here is Asia. Um, this straight, right, the Dardanelles during World War II, this was an important her- spot. It was a, a massacre happened of the Anzac forces, the Australian and New Zealand forces, but it all happened here in the Dardanelles. Uh, but so it, it's always been this division between Europe and Asia. Well, Paul ends up getting blown basically to a whole nother continent and he ends up in Philippi. And in Philippi, he comes at, gets his first convert. It's a lady named Lydia. She's a very powerful businesswoman. She's the first person that came to Christ there. Then Paul's like leading her to Christ. He's going around evangelizing. And the story of, is crazy of how the church in Philippi was founded. Uh, it's kind of like Crossroads, right? But, anyway, but you'll see why in a second. Uh, Paul then is going around evangelizing and there's this girl who's by, got this demon in her and this demon allows her to kind of uh, be a, um, a fortune teller, right? So a lot of people are making money off of her fortune teller skills. Well, she's going around and she's like kind of yelling and distracting while Paul's preaching. In the verse, in Acts 16, it actually says, Paul got annoyed with her so he cast a demon out of her. That's literally what it says. Paul got annoyed and he cast, I'm like, man, I wish I had that power. People annoy me. <laughs> Come out, little demon child. Anyway, so she loses her ability to fortune tell and her owners, her handlers are like, whoa, so isn't it crazy? Like, so here's what happens. She comes to Christ, which is wild to think that one of the first people that came to Christ was a slave, yeah. a businesswoman. All of the underdogs at first, the women in that culture, that were maybe oftentimes seen as possession, but a powerful woman was one of the first people. And then a slave came. So he gets thrown in prison. They bring up these accusations against him. First of all, they flog him. Then they throw him in prison, put him in chains. So it wasn't just like prison. It was like serious prison. Paul's singing that night. There's an earthquake. The doors fling open to the prison. The chains fall off. And the guard realizes I'm dead. All the prisoners have escaped on my watch. So he's about to kill himself. He pulls out a sword to kill himself. And Paul's like, yo, bro, we're still here. You're good. And the guy has this moment. He goes, who are these people? And he turns to Paul and he says, what do I need to do to be saved? And Paul tells him it and bam, his third convert. So you got this crazy story of these converts. And this is the story of Philippi, the church of Philippi from Acts 16. And Paul, man, he really holds these people dear in his heart because he went through some major struggles there. He was put in prison. Um, But what's interesting about Philippi, this is a fascinating thing about Philippi. This was the location where the battle that basically created the Roman empire happened. So this is the battle where Cassius and Brutus, do you remember Brutus? He was the guy that stabbed uh, on the Ides of March. Remember where of the Ides of March? He stabbed C- uh, Julius Caesar. Remember that story? He says, et tu Brute, uh, and then he kills him. Remember that? Some of y'all were sleeping during that class. But they rose up against Mark Anthony, you know, the, the, raps, uh, the uh, Latino singer. And it was Mark Anthony and a guy named Octavian. And they came and they had this battle in Philippi and Octavian and Mark Anthony ended up running out Brutus and Cassius. And that paved the way for what became the Roman Empire. In fact, Oct- Octavian's name got changed to Caesar Augustus, who you'll remember it says, in those days, Caesar Augustus sent out a decree that all the world should be under census. That's the guy that would usher in the, Ra- the, the Roman Empire when Jesus was in charge. But Philippi was a special place because it's where the Roman Empire started. So the Phil- Philippi was actually populated with former Roman soldiers and they were given all the rights of Roman citizenship. So there were this little enclave and all this occupied ter- territory. It was like a little Rome right there. And it was a, a source of much pride for the Philippians because they're like, hey, we're not like you. We're from Seguin. Like, <laughs> like, we're from Philippi. We have rights none of you occupied people have. It was a very important right. So this is where the context of Paul, who's writing this letter, and I love how he opens the letter. This is what he says. He starts the letter by saying, Paul and Timothy, we're servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. I also love too that he's like, to all the, he doesn't start with the leaders of the church. He just starts with like, hey, all you saints, and also the people that are supposed to be in charge. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'll tell you this. When I was in high school, 
I'll never forget, I was in a Bible study and I read that saints thing. And the teacher said, you're saints. And I was like, whoa, whoa, no, no. I'd never seen it say saints before. And she said, no, you're, you're a saint. And I was like, no, because you know, you know what came to my mind? At that time, man, I was 16 years old and I was a boy and I had a lot of raging hormones. I was thinking about women all the time. And I had all these horrible thoughts in my mind that I knew I shouldn't have had. And I'm like, I'm not a saint. Saints think good thoughts, right? If you grew up in a Catholic church, you're like, well, saints are people that are set apart and holy and they walk around floating on, all right? And Paul's like, no, you guys, you're saints. And I didn't like that. I couldn't, I couldn't take it. In fact, there's another version that says this. It says to all God's holy people. What's crazy about this is that's you. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And what Paul is starting off by saying is, listen, your identity isn't found by being a Roman citizen who lives in Philippi. Your identity has nothing to do with what you own. It doesn't have to do anything with where you live, what you've accomplished, who you've hung out with, who you know. He's like, the ultimate identity that you need to be identified, the only one that really matters is your identity in Christ. And he says, out of that identity, everything changes. In fact, what he's basically saying is this. As a saint, we'll, we'll unpack it in a second, but he's basically saying, we don't do to be. We be to do. Do be, do be, do. <laughs> Here's my translation of that. We don't do good works and good stuff because we're uh, to be saints. We do good works because we already are saints. And that changes everything. Because have you ever noticed how invincible you feel when you truly feel loved? Like all sorts of people can be angry and against me, but when I, like my wife, I know she loves me. And I'm like, I don't care what you think about me. My wife loves me. There's a power that comes with that. And there's this power that comes when we recognize no matter how bad you feel about yourself, no matter how messed up, much you messed up yesterday, you maybe dragged yourself into church today going, oh my gosh, I hope the place doesn't crash down around me because I've done some stupid stuff yesterday. God loves you no more today than he did yesterday, no less today than he did yesterday because in his mind, you're a saint. You're already made holy and it's not because of anything you did. It's all because Jesus Christ is what he sees in you. And that's a whole new perspective where you're not constantly trying to feel like you have to live up and be enough. He said, no, you're enough because of Jesus. Now you go out there and live up to what's already in you. Right. And that's a whole new way of looking at things. It's like, I'm loved. I don't need anybody's approval. Even if they reject me, I'm loved. Like we sang today, I am loved. I'm loved by the Father, loved by you. And Paul, that's what he leads the whole letter off. He's like, hey guys, I know you're Roman citizens, blah, 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 whoop de doo you know what's the most important about you? You're a saint. When, when, when God looks at you, he sees you as a saint. And so when you do these good works that you're called to do, it's not so you can get approval. It's because you already are approved. So he goes on and he says this. I thank my God. Remember, he loves the Philippian church. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer for you with joy. There's that word joy because of the, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He's like, you guys stuck with me when things were really hard. And then he says this, and I'm confident, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. So here's what he's saying. He leads off by saying, hey, you guys are already completely loved and approved. You're saints. And I know that you're gonna keep becoming a saint. And it's this thing that we call the theology of already, not yet. You already are a saint. But, Paul, but, but it says in John, it's a, uh, uh, I think it's first John, it says, but yet we, what we will become has not even been seen. Right. Like you have no clue what you're capable of when you're walking in that sainthood in Christ. And that's what he's saying. He's like, you're there, but there's still more to do. And that's what's called the sanctification process. It's the action of making or declaring something holy. The action or process of being freed from sin or purified. it, And that's what we're all in right now. In terms of how you stand with God, you're already freed from sin. Now the battle we face every day is to walk in that freedom from sin and realize, man, when I mess up, that's not me anymore. That's old Joel. That's the part of the background check. 
we need to forget about because that's not who I am anymore. I don't do those things anymore. All I'm known by now is in Christ, I'm a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And when guilt and condemnation come on you and people kind of try and remember, remind you of your past, oh man, I remember we used to do this stuff together. You're like, nah, 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 nah. that's not me anymore. In Christ, I'm being transformed, I'm being renewed, I'm being changed. And that is your new identity. And Paul says, that's how you start out. You start out from a place of recognizing the weight of sainthood. You're already a saint and everything God is doing is transforming you now. And, and, and here's the really important thing. It's a simple thing. We used to learn this in Sunday school. A saint orders their life with joy. There's an order to how we, what we place value most on. The first thing is Jesus, then others, then yourself. You wake up one day and you're not feeling any joy. Maybe it's because you're focusing on yourself too much. Maybe you need to go out and do something for others and your joy will come back. Maybe you're living for others' approval and maybe the only person you need to focus on is the approval of Jesus and your joy will come back. That's the order a saint lives in. And when you live by that, joy is a natural outcropping of it. Recognizing, man, I've been forgiven, I've been saved and now I'm gonna rise up, put my shoulders back, stand up straight and walk into all that God says I already am. And even when I wake up and I feel horrible about myself, that's a lie. My feelings are lying to me. The truth is, I'm a saint. If you look at those saints on the wall in the Catholic Church, you're right up there with them. Because in God's eyes, man, it's all His grace that gets us there. And you live up to what He's already called you to be. And that's what Paul starts this whole book. He says, guys, the foundation for joy is being in Christ. That's your identity. Not where you live, not where you came from, not what you got not what you've accomplished, not what's on your big old bio that everybody reads. That's not who you are. You're in Christ. And no title, even if you have no title after your name, you're in Christ. And that's all the identity you need. So with that kind of confidence, you can charge the gates of hell with a water pistol. <laughs> Coming at you. That's the confidence you need is in Christ. You guys receive that? Yeah, let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of your word. Thank you for these letters that Paul wrote, man, and just the truth that's in them. And I pray that over these next few weeks and months, you'd just be showing us more and more that the foundation for our joy is the fact that you already approved of us. We are loved by you and we are saints. No matter what the guilt we feel, no matter what we're struggling with, we are saints. And I pray that we'd live up to that calling. Let it only let us walk worthy of that calling that's already on us. If you're here this morning, you do not have your relationship right with Jesus, I'm gonna get you, give you a chance to take care of that right now enter into your sainthood. Uh, we're going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this and you mean it in your whole heart, God's going to come and transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, set you up with him in, his, in eternity. Let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, Welcome to Sainthood. <laughs> We've got some resources for you in the back under the Do It Again sign. You guys have a great week. Uh, we've got um, some great, uh, great uh, cookies and tacos and everything out there for the, supporting the ladies' ministry under the pavilion. Y'all go hang out there and enjoy the day. Be blessed. We'll see you next week for the next part of Philippians. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.